Well, let me get started. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's uh, edition of the Tufts University Healthy Aging Seminar Series for the spring of 2022, although it's not very spring-like outside today here in Boston. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Finkbeiner from the University of California, San Francisco. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Uh, Dr. Finkbeiner. Steve is the director of the Center for Systems and Therapeutics and a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes. In 2009, with support from Bay Area philanthropist, he established the Tobe Corrett Center for Neurodegenerative Disease Research at Gladstone to accelerate the development of drug therapies for patients suffering from conditions such as Huntington's disease, Finkbeiner is also the director of the Hellman Family Foundation Alzheimer's Disease Research Program and an investigator in the Roddenberry Stem Cell Center at Gladstone. He has faculty appointments as a professor of neurology and physiology at UCSF, and he earned his bachelor's degree from Wheaton College and an MD and PhD in neuroscience from Yale University. He completed his internship in internal medicine and was chief resident in neurology at UCSF, followed by a research fellowship at Harvard here in Boston. So without further ado, it's a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Finkbeiner, and we're looking forward to your presentation entitled, What Can Progranulin Teach Us About Proteostasis, Neuroinflammation, and Age-Related Neurodegenerative Disease? Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Roger, as a kind introduction. And um, I'm not specifically an aging researcher, but as Roger mentioned, we uh, have been very interested <clears throat> in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, especially age-related ones like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's for many years. And I am part of a consortium uh, that studies proteostasis and have grown more interested in kind of the intersection between aging and neurodegenerative disease. So I'm looking forward to uh, questions that the audience has and maybe ways that they can even stimulate my thinking in this regard. Um, I thought we work in a number of areas and I thought given the interest of this center uh, in aging and, and sort of neurodegenerative disease, uh, I thought maybe one area that might be of interest is uh, some of our work on progranulin. And so the, que the question I'd like to try to talk about a little bit today is what can progranulin teach us about proteostasis, neuroinflammation, and age-related neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, just uh, a few disclosures. We get funding from a variety of uh, places. Uh, as Roger mentioned, uh, in addition to the academic work we do, I also uh, run a, the Toby Corette Center, which is especially focused on trying to translate some of these discoveries to make an impact for patients. And part of that involves uh, sponsored research agreements with a variety of uh, drug companies, as well as uh, starting new companies. And so uh, these are some of my disclosures. So in today's talk, what I'd like to do is try to maybe address a couple of questions and then share with you uh, some observations that we've made. These include what is progranulin and what does it do? Uh, what regulates progranulin levels? Um, you know, where are we at modeling progranulin dependent neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation? And uh, what are the sort of insights we've gained by doing that in particular, uh, uh, Im implicating the lysis lysosomal dysfunction and the therapeutic importance of autophagy, um, and then try to give you a working model of progranulin in disease that I hope uh, will at least begin to try to address the question that I framed uh, this lecture for. So first, uh, you know, progranulin. So progranulin is a 68.5 kilodalton uh, polypeptide. Uh, that includes seven and a half of these cysteine-rich domains, a sort of like a pearl necklace in a way. Um, this protein is produced intracellularly and it's a secreted protein, um, but it is processed by a variety of proteases. Uh, there's a molecule slippy that actually kind of protects the molecule from proteases, but uh, enzymes like elastase and um, matrix metalloproteases, MMPs, can cleave that into these uh, cysteine-rich bits uh, that are called granulins. Uh, this processing can occur extracellularly as well as in lysosomes. And what's fascinating to me is that uh, there's a general idea, I, this is an oversimplification, but there's a general idea that the holoprotein actually serves anti-inflammatory functions, whereas uh, these um, 
proteolytic uh, cleavage products may be important for promoting inflammation. Importantly, within the central nervous system, both neurons and microglia and astrocytes for that matter make progranulin. And there's been a big question in the field about kind of what the relative roles uh, that these two cell types play, both in uh, the, the sort of normal biology of progranulin, but also in uh, diseases that are related to progranulin deficiency. Um, the general gist is that uh, progranulin uh, in a healthy context may play an important role, a trophic role, as well as uh, uh, roles in, in, in um, wound repair. <clears throat> it came to our attention because haploinsufficiency of progranulin uh, is a major cause of frontotemporal dementia. Now, frontotemporal dementia, for those who aren't familiar with it, is uh, a, a form of dementia. Um, so in that sense, related to Alzheimer's disease, but it really has a different clinical profile. So as opposed to um, Alzheimer's disease, where sometimes the spatial uh, impairment of memory is really dominant, in frontotemporal dementia, it's more common that uh, you see behavioral manifestations and, and speech uh, language issues and other things. Um, we got interested because uh, unlike Alzheimer's disease and a number of the other uh, disorders we study, uh, that seem quite complex. The idea that you might have just haploinsufficiency of a gene as a cause for dementia seems to open up an obvious therapeutic approach of potentially actually restoring the levels of that gene. Uh, and so um, that got us interested in uh, kind of investigating more. And this was a number of years ago when, when this work began. What's interesting to me too is that although it uh, progranulin came to our attention because of uh, its link to frontotemporal dementia. Since that discovery, uh, there have been rare individuals who have been found that actually have uh, both progranulin alleles mutated, and these develop a, a lysosomal storage disorder known as neural lipofusinosis. Um, another fascinating kind of connection, uh, which hopefully is relevant to this center, is that at least in model organisms, there's been a link between progranulin and aging. Not only do progranulin levels go up with age, but uh, there's some evidence that it actually can control longevity, at least in some model organisms. And then in the most recent and largest Parkinson's disease, uh, GWAS, which we uh, helped with, progranulin showed up as a hit. So although, again, identified as a gene that causes FTD, variants in uh, granulin also seem to be associated with increased Parkinson's disease risk, and it's also been linked to Alzheimer's and ALS as well. So uh, I'll give you a spoiler alert for the talk. Uh, I think the, the reason that I think progranulin has a lot to teach us is that it's not just a gene uh, linked to this rare form of frontotemporal dementia, but I think there may be a relationship between progranulin levels, perhaps function of the autophagy and lysosomal system, and risk for various neurodegenerative diseases spanning from an aggressive lysosomal storage disease that appears relatively early -er in life to FTD to maybe even more common disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So uh, just to dig a little bit deeper into progranulin and, and uh, some of the features of this disease. Um, so it's a heterogeneous progressive uh, disorder. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, FTD is thought to be the most common cause of early onset dementia, so uh, uh, for folks less than 60 years of age. I mentioned that there, it's, it's much more genetic than uh, the other forms of dementia. Um, these are some of the genes C9RF72, tau, and progranulin that are the major causes of frontotemporal, genetic causes of frontotemporal dementia. Uh, mutations that lead to haploinsufficiency of progranulin are the second most uh, common cause, genetic cause of FTD after C9RF72. And what's been interesting as well, I think, is the array of uh, pathology that's been observed in brains from patients with um, FTD due to progranulin deficiency. Uh, there clearly is a loss of uh, neurons, especially from the frontal and parietal cort cortices, um, but there's also a very prominent microgliosis, astrogliosis, and neuroinflammation. And a suggestion that uh, the lysosomes may be dysfunctional. So one of the uh, common hallmarks in um, brains of patients with FTD due to progranulin deficiencies, uh, lipofusinosis. There also is abnormal accumulation and deposition of TDP43. 
TDP43 is um, a DNA and RNA binding protein splicing factor that uh, is abnormal uh, at most uh, commonly recognized in ALS, but it also shows up in other uh, disorders, including F about half of FTD patients, as well as um, Alzheimer's disease patients. But it's um, uh, very common in patients who have progranular deficient FTD. Um, so one of the major kind of platforms that we have invented a number of years ago and continue to use and develop uh, to study neurodegenerative diseases is something we call robotic microscopy that helps us develop uh, cell models, uh, including tissue, brain tissue, and organoid models of these disorders. Uh, the technology involves a robotic incubator that delivers plates to a nest. We've integrated a robotic arm that transfers plates uh, from the nest to a microscope that we've designed that's fully automated. And the special sauce is that we've programmed that microscope so that it can take pictures of cells in a well, but it keeps track of exactly where they are in space. And so it's possible then to put the plate back and have it brought back on a subsequent day, week or month and go back to precisely the same location and even observe the same cells. And so what we can get out of that then are these um, stacks of images that allow us to identify and track individual cells, much like you would in a patient population in a clinical trial. And we've also developed a whole array of biosensors to help us both visualize neurodegeneration phenotypes, but also some of the underlying biochemical pathways that we think are relevant uh, to those processes to understand what the relationship is. Um, we call this the physical exam of the cell because for us, it's a little reminiscent of a patient going to the doctor's office and, and uh, the, you know, having a chief complaint and then a series of tests to try to understand more deeply uh, what it's due to. Uh, the systems generate terabytes of data, and so uh, we've developed some sophisticated computational pipelines that include uh, artificial intelligence tools. And the ultimate goal for us is to be able to develop blueprints for understanding disease and that would enable us to intervene in predictable ways to alter fate. And I'll just say that uh, one of the things we learned uh, after kind of developing this system is that it's extremely sensitive. So it's a, we've calculated it's about 100 to 1,000 fold more sensitive than standard high throughput screening approaches that just look at snapshots. And it's especially well suited to, I think, studying neurodegenerative disease and even stem cell models of neurodegenerative disease uh, where the processes unfold slowly. There can be a lot of stochasticity, asynchronicity, things that make it really difficult to, to take snapshots and really get meaningful information. And we've developed a whole suite of statistical tools, largely based actually on clinical trial approaches um, to enable us to measure things early and then ask the question, what is the future fate that those uh, early changes predict and help us address things like whether a particular mechanism is causal or maybe a incidental or even a coping response. So as I mentioned, uh, this system generates images. Uh, we stitch them together into montages. These little spots here are individual cell bodies of neurons. Our computer pipeline can identify and uh, assign unique identifying numbers to these, almost like social security numbers, and then track the same cells from uh, subsequent images over time. And then, as I mentioned, at the beginning of the experiments, we can introduce biosensors with different fluorescent uh, proteins attached so we can visualize different biologies in those cells dynamically over time. And we can even take advantage of the fact that we get a spatial map of every cell in the dish, including neurons and non-neuronal cells. So we can study things that involve cell autonom autonomous as well as cell non-autonomous relationships, including, for example, the transmission of proteinopathies from one cell to the next, or issues of neuroinflammation where we're looking at interactions between glia and neurons. At the end, we can also fix the cells and rerun them so that if there are things that we want to see that we can only see with uh, immunocytic chemistry, we can do that too. Um, just to give you a sense of sort of how this works, uh, I'm just going to give you an example, published example from uh, ALS. Uh, here I mentioned before this protein TDP43, normally it sits in the nucleus uh, and we can use these different fluorophores and we can model this in a dish. Uh, what people have observed in patients with both FTD and ALS is that TDP43 can be mislocalized to the cytoplasm. So you're starting to see some TDP43 signal here in the uh, dendrites. And although that clearly was an abnormal feature you see in patients, it really wasn't clear whether that was actually pathogenic or an incidental finding. Likewise, uh, 
we see an accumulation of TDP43, but again, it wasn't clear how important levels of TDP43 are. And then, uh, of course, um, the hallmark pathology in some of these diseases is the formation of aggregates that you can detect, inclusions, uh, if you will, in tissue. And again, not clear what role those play. Clearly abnormal, but uh, not known. So what we can do with our system is actually follow those cells longitudinally, detect each of those uh, uh, phenotypes early, and then ask what happens to those same cells later. What we found was that when we have a mutation in TDB43 associated with ALS or FTD, uh, it does absolutely increase the risk of neurodegeneration. This is HR for hazard ratio, uh, and it's significant. What was even more striking, though, were variations in protein levels um, that uh, had a very strong uh, uh, relationship to neurodegeneration um, with uh, a very strong dose-dependent increase. Cytoplasmic mislocalization, likewise, uh, increased risk of death. But maybe to some surprise, uh, the formation of those visible aggregates, if anything, uh, seemed to reduce the risk for neurodegeneration, almost as if the cell was mothballing the protein uh, from these more toxic forms into something that might be less harmful to the cell. So with these tools in hand, we turn to try to model progranulin deficient FTD, uh, beginning initially uh, using uh, just rodent neurons where we would take sRNAs to try to knock down progranulin levels. And we could demonstrate that uh, the reduction of progranulin to roughly 50%, which is kind of what we would predict for an FTD progranulin patient, uh, and we could demonstrate this um, uh, using um, Western blots and PCR led to neurodegeneration phenotypes, including retraction and reduction of neurites shown here, as well as an increased risk of neurodegeneration. And so these curves are generated from our microscope where we actually um, generate Kaplan-Meier plots following individual cells and then uh, transform them into these uh, cumulative risk of death. So the higher the curve is, the worse the cells are surviving. Some colleagues at Gladstone uh, developed mouse models of uh, progranulin deficient FTD, and we've helped them characterize those models. And uh, interestingly, if we isolate microglia from those uh, progranulin deficient mice, we do see a significant increase in cytokine levels uh, from those cells when they're stimulated with LPS. Likewise, if we make co-cultures of the primary microglia and rodent neurons from those mice, we can see also a significant increase in the um, neurodegeneration that's seen. So uh, evidence that both progranulin deficiency can induce cell autonomous effects, both in microglia and neurons leading to neurodegeneration and Neuro and, and um, microglial activation inflammation, and that together uh, that seems to even enhance further the neurodegeneration that we observe. So, this strong dose dependent effect of progranulin got us really, and the fact that it was cell autonomous got us really interested at the time in trying to better understand how progranulin levels are regulated. Uh, really, at the time, very little was known. There were a few uh, genes that were proposed to be important. So what we did was to devise a genome-wide genetic screen to see if we could uh, address this question. And again, it was based on the premise that uh, progranular hepatitis insufficiency leads to neuronal dysfunction and death. And the appeal to us uh, of doing an unbiased genome-wide genetic screen was that it could lead to the identification of genes that either suppress or enhance progranulin levels. And both of those would be interesting for helping us understand better uh, how progranulin is regulated. But so-called loss of function suppressors might be especially interesting from a therapeutic standpoint, because although in this case we're targeting these genes with genetic tools, uh, if you think about it, a loss of function suppressor uh, might be amenable to pharmacological inhibition to basically get the same effect, and that might end up being a useful strategy for therapy. So I won't go into great detail. We've published this. Um, I'll just say that uh, a lot of times when people look for uh, regulators of a gene, they do reporter gene screens. We decided we wanted to do something that was actually focused on measuring progranulin itself in the extracellular media. <clears throat> we wanted to do that because we worried that just a reporter gene strategy might lead to only transcription factors being discovered. And we really wanted to understand 
proprinolin biology more broadly. So we wanted to, for example, if, if they exist, discover modifiers that might affect progranulin, you know, translation, secretion, uh, degradation, uptake. And so we thought an ELISA assay would work better. So we screened over 16,000 genes uh, using an sRNA strategy. It was before kind of the advent of CRISPR, really. Um, and so these were pools of four sRNAs. They had different sequences. They targeted the same gene, but different parts of the same gene. And the, the reasoning was that by doing that, you can avoid some of the um, uh, artifacts of off-target effects, or at least identify pools that are really pointing to the gene rather than some artifact. We identified almost 800 sRNA pools that seem to modulate progranulin uh, significantly. Um, for resource reasons, we ended up focusing initially on just the druggable genome. Those, uh, for, for those who don't uh, aren't familiar with this terminology, druggable genome just refers to a subset of uh, uh, proteins encoded by the genome that um, are popular pharmacological targets because they may have a receptor on them or enzymatic activity that can be inhibited. Um, I think nowadays uh, the, the concept of druggable genomes expanding now that we have new tools like antisense oligonucleotides and other approaches to target genes themselves. But ultimately, um, after secondary screening and then eventually tertiary screening, we were left with 33 genes that we really were confident uh, were bona fide progranulin modifiers. And um, the cool thing nowadays is there's so many bioinformatic tools that allow you to then take hits from the screen and try to make more biological sense from, uh, from some of these collections of genes. And in particular, a common question we, um, we and others ask is, you know, do, do the hits suggest enrichment of certain biological pathways that might give us clues about relevant biology? And unsurprisingly, um, you know, a, the largest uh, section of modifiers were actually uh, genes that are involved in transcription regulation. But we were really excited to see that almost, well, over half uh, of the genes fell outside of transcription regulation, kind of validating, I think, our approach to focus on using ELISA to measure protein levels. And these include pathways like receptor cell signaling, protein homeostasis, and TNF receptor signaling. And Protein homeostasis has been a longstanding interest for us. Um, for those of you interested in aging, uh, so, some will remember that uh, of the seven so-called pillars of aging, protein homeostasis is one of them. And so for that reason, we uh, focused in particular on protein homeostasis. And if you look at some of the genes that showed up in that pathway, the striking thing for us was how uh, many showed up in the autophagy and lysosomal pathway, um, which I will uh, get to uh, further. The other thing I think that's kind of cool from this work was that um, of the uh, 33 hits that we found um, that validated all the way through our tertiary screen, um, the informatics programs told us that there already were six drugs that existed to four of those hits. And so we thought this might be an interesting opportunity both to provide some pharmacological validation for the genetic work, but also potentially to get a start on small molecules that might ultimately be therapeutic strategies. What I'm showing you here are dose dependent effects of all six molecules and to our surprise, all six replicated the uh, effects of the sRNA on progranulin levels in the sense that they all uh, induced uh, significant increases in progranulin, and they did so in a, both a dose-dependent fashion and in some cases in a very potent uh, fashion too. So some of these were active at a nanomolar uh, concentration. So we, um, so for us, we, you know, this is strong evidence that the genetic uh, results could be confirmed uh, that it was an on-target effect of the uh, of the sRNAs that we were looking at, and so these. Uh, Proteins in particular, TRAP1, L3, FOXO, and uh, adimethylase, GMJD6, uh, are relevant for regulating progranulin expression. But as I mentioned, they also are interesting starting materials since many of these have been in humans already as a potential therapy for uh, progranulin FTD. And we've begun uh, moving these in vivo. We've been able to demonstrate that they induce progranulin, and we're moving now toward trying to assess efficacy. So again, you know, with uh, the results of the uh, screen pointing strongly to um, the proteostasis system and the autophagy lysosomal system in particular being important, we wanted to uh, dig a little bit deeper uh, to see if we could get some uh, direct evidence 
to support that uh, by studying um, cell biology. We also, up until this point, had worked entirely in rodent cells or even in cell lines, and we wanted to get some additional evidence that this really was relevant in human cells, and particularly patient-derived uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So um, other colleagues at UCSF had uh, uh, collected samples from FTD patients and had developed IPS lines. This is one of the most common uh, missense mutations uh, leading to progranulin FTD, and we could demonstrate that when we took those IPS lines from FTD patients and differentiated them into a four-brain type neuron, we could demonstrate that the progranulin levels that those produced were approximately half of what you see in uh, control cells. Moreover, when we uh, looked at those cells with some of the same approaches that I mentioned earlier with robotic microscopy, we were able to con further confirm loss of neurites as well as an increased risk of death neurodegeneration. So again, confirming that uh, some of the cell autonomous effects we'd seen in rodent neurons seem to also be observed in human neurons as well. And then um, interestingly, as we kind of started to really go down the lysosome pathway, we could see clearly some very significant and abnormal uh, uh, changes in um, lysosome structure and function and accumulation of TDP43, all features of the human disease. So all this was very encouraging. It suggested to us that within a differentiated patient-derived human IPS, we could replicate some of the key features seen in the human disease, including neurodegeneration phenotypes like loss of neurites and, and uh, changes in survival, as well as some of these um, abnormalities associated with uh, both accumulation of TDP43 and maybe lysosomal dysfunction. We next wanted to see if we could uh, dig a little deeper on the inflammation side. Um, and about this time, several new protocols had been developed uh, to be able to differentiate IPS into microglia. We've uh, worked with a number of these protocols. Um, uh, the first one we started to work with was the abutadol protocol. Um, and uh, this involves a series of steps um, to, to be able to convert IPS to microglia and takes about um, 40 days. But at the end of that process, we can see cells that uh, label with appropriate uh, markers uh, we would expect for IPS cells. And we were able to take uh, IPS cells both from healthy volunteers as well as FTD patients with progranulin deficiency all the way through this process and generate cells that were um, highly reminiscent of microglia. Interestingly, uh, we observed that um, uh, when we compared um, four-brain neurons grown by themselves to ones with microglia present, uh, the presence of microglia seemed to increase the amount of progranulin present. We, in these experiments, these co-culture experiments, we don't yet know where that progranulin is coming from, if it's primarily from the neurons, the extra progranulin, or from uh, microglia. Um, but it's a clue that there may be a neuroglial interaction here that we're seeing in culture. Um, to try to look at that more carefully, we also did imaging experiments where we looked at microglial morphology <clears throat> and kind of doing mix and match experiments. So adding either four brain neurons and microglia from healthy volunteers or variably uh, from FTD patients or healthy volunteers or from um, microglia and four brain neurons, both from FTD patients. And we did see a quite a dramatic change in especially the morphology of microglia under these circumstances, going from a more quiescent state uh, when we used um, samples from healthy volunteers to uh, morphologies that are more closely associated with uh, reactive microglia uh, when we derived them from FTD patients. Uh, we don't show it here, but we also saw a dramatic increase in neurodegeneration uh, when, uh, in, this, in this example as well, suggesting potentially a synergistic uh, interaction. And as further evidence, we also measured cytokine levels under these di different circumstances. And you can see in particular with TNF-alpha and IL-10, a really dramatic synergistic uh, increase in the levels of those cytokines, when in particular, we combine uh, microglia from uh, FTD patients with uh, four brain neurons from FTD patients. And I think that's interesting because uh, compared with when we grow these cells, uh, as monocultures, uh, the levels are much lower. So although I mentioned earlier that we see cell evidence of cell autonomous um, dysfunction in each of these cell types individually when uh, progranulin is deficient, clearly there's an additional 
uh, cell non-autonomous component that involves neuroglial interaction that may be very important. Um, we've uh, also been able, as I mentioned, to see uh, these abnormal accumulations of TDP43. Um, this, these images are from rodent neurons, but we have seen similar things in human neurons. We have to wait quite a while. It takes about 30 to 60 days uh, to be able to see these accumulate, but we clearly see evidence of uh, abnormal accumulation and deposition of TDP43 uh, in the FTD examples and not in the healthy control examples uh, of endogenous, I should say, F uh, and TDP43. And we have also seen evidence of abnormal lysosomes as well uh, under these conditions. Um, and that includes uh, increases in lysosomal size uh, as well as um, number. And um, you know, we didn't know whether those abnormalities were really kind of functionally related to progranulin, if they were reversible, or if they might be something that's in some way linked to a germline mutation in progranulin. So to try to test that idea, we took advantage of the uh, fact that we'd identified a number of hits uh, from our um, screen that could normalize progranulin levels. And so we chose uh, sRNAs against three of those that we knew normalized progranulin levels and asked whether they could reverse the lysosomal defect. And uh, that's in fact what we found. So uh, when we used these sRNAs, um, we could reduce um, the lysis tracker vesicle diameter, which is a proxy for lysosomal size um, from its elevated state uh, when progranulin was deficient to back to something that was closer to control. This suggests that the lysosomal change in structure and function that we see is likely to be a functional consequence of progranulin deficiency that may be reversible, which is encouraging. Um, there, uh, so to try to understand better what exactly the connection is between progranulin and uh, the lysosome, we asked whether progranulin was actually a lysosomal protein. And to do this, we did biochemical purifications of lysosomes and could show that in fractions that uh, were labeled with LAMP1, a lysosomal uh, marker, uh, we, they were enriched in progranulin. Furthermore, uh, if we did electron microscopy on uh, cells from progranulin deficient samples, neurons compared with control, we could see clear evidence of abnormal accumulation of material in the lysosomes from cells with progranulin deficiency. Again, uh, uh, supporting the idea that progranulin deficiency in some way leads to abnormal uh, lysosomal structure and function. Uh, well, you know, given uh, this fact, we wanted to we, we want to continue to try to understand the nature of the lysosomal dysfunction that's happening. And to do that, we've invested quite a bit of effort to develop biosensors, in fact, like a whole toolbox to be able to look at different aspects of lysosomal function. And one of the most useful have been a series of uh, reporters that are linked to photoswitchable proteins, uh, either Dendra2 or EOS 3.2. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in, a, in, a, in two slides. Another very useful biosensor has been this uh, pH sensor called FLARE. This was a biosensor that was developed by Diane Barber here at UCSF, uh, mostly to study cancer. Um, but this is a genetically encoded biosensor that will uh, enable investigators to look at luminal pH. And the way it does, the way it works is that it uh, she's tethered a pH sensitive super ecliptic fluorine GFP to a pH insensitive M cherry uh, using a polypeptide derived from LAMP1 so that the GFP is on the inside of the lysosome and the M cherry is on the outside. <clears throat> and it's possible with this to then express this biosensor and to use the fluorescence of GFP uh, with a normalization curve to be able to uh, measure directly uh, the pH of lysosomes. And the huge advantage we found of this approach over the dyes is that we can study this now longitudinally and especially over time frames that are relevant for some of the neurodegeneration phenotypes that we see. And indeed, when we put this biosensor into uh, neurons from FTD patients, we see a really dramatic evidence that the pH in these lysosomes is abnormal. It's much more basic uh, or at least neutral 
than what uh, lysosomes are supposed to be. And that's really important for those of you familiar with lysosome uh, function because many of the enzymes that are present in lysosomes are highly pH dependent, and some of them, frankly, uh, become um, non-functional uh, at higher pHs. <clears throat> I mentioned before this um, photoswitchable protein assay, and I just want to say a little bit more about that because uh, I think it is broadly useful. So um, uh, um, the illustration I'm using here involves a protein called Dendro2, which is from sea coral. Normally that protein uh, exhibits a green fluorescence, and so if we introduce that into a neuron, for example, all you see is fluorescence in the green channel, not in the red. But if you pulse blue light on that protein, you can convert irreversibly a pool of the green protein to a protein that fluoresces red. And so much like you would do a um, radioactive pulse chase assay, uh, you can do what we call an optical pulse chase assay, where you convert a pool of protein to the red fluorescent protein, uh, and then don't show any more light, uh, blue light on it, and you can then track the disappearance of that red protein over time uh, as a measure of clearance of that protein or any protein to which it's attached. <clears throat> and you can keep track of the cell using the, the uh, green version of Dendro2, which continues to be made uh, constitutively by the cell. So we've been able to show, for example, that you can take a uh, photoswitchable protein, tether it to a degron that targets it to the lysosome, and you can demonstrate that it has much accelerated clearance. Uh, again, um, you know, illustrating the point that you can turn these into reporter assays for the flux of either proteostasis pathways or specific disease-causing proteins. And in fact, we've made a whole raft of assays uh, on this basis that look at proteosome function, autophagy, mitophagy, and the metabolism of a variety of disease-causing proteins. Now you might ask, what? Uh, okay, so what? You know, there's a metabolic pulse chase assay. What's the difference, or what's the uh, value? Well, one obvious thing is that, and we've already seen this, is that we can see that the uh, we get spatial information. So with uh, with uh, pulse chase radioactive pulse chase assay, you just grind up the cells and you measure extracts. In this case, we actually can measure different species of proteins that have different turnover rates within the same cell and look at where they're localized. But I think that there are two other reasons, particularly for uh, toxic aggregation prone disease causing proteins, that this approach is extremely helpful. Uh, and you can do sort of a thought experiment to appreciate that. <clears throat> Remember in the um, radioactive pulse chase assay, the way the experiment's done is you label the cells and you stop the experiment at various uh, time points and then do the assays. Uh, but you don't really know whether the cells that you started with have survived the whole time. And if cells die during that time, it's just the same way. It, it's, the, the assay will confuse that with actual clearance of the protein. Uh, you know, whether the protein's gone because the protein got cleared or because the cells died altogether, the assay can't tell the difference. <clears throat> Whereas we can, when we image the cells, uh, we can, we can uh, make sure that we're making those measurements in cells that live the entire time. The other is this issue of protein aggregation, which, as many of you know, is a common feature of age-related neurodegenerative diseases. The issue there is that once proteins aggregate, they're difficult to solubilize, and a lot of times they simply don't actually get solubilized sufficiently to get on the blots that you need to do the assay. So in the same way as cell death, protein aggregation can appear to be protein clearance because basically this protein is not available. And the effects are huge. We've done actually calculations and it can throw these two features, cell death and protein aggregation, can throw the results off by easily 50%. So um, we've <clears throat> not only invested a lot of effort in making a lot of biosensors to look at these questions, both for proteostasis pathways and proteins, but we've also invested in uh, developing technologies like this LED array that will help facilitate protein um, optical pulse labeling of every cell in the dish all at once, which speeds things up and helps create more reproducible results. So with these tools, we, want, we tried to ask directly the question, does programming deficiency alter the clearance of TDP43? And we did this by fusing TDP43 to Dendro2 and then doing those turnover assays that I just mentioned. 
And whether we're looking at mouse primary cortical neurons or human cortical neurons, we see a really big change in the half-life of TDP43 in a programmed efficient context. Specifically, the half-life gets a lot longer as if the neurons uh, are really having difficulty turning it over and clearing it. And we, th we suspect that this is directly related to the pathology we see, which is the abnormal accumulation and deposition of TDP43 uh, in both our models and in patients. But we don't think the dysfunction is limited to TDP43. We think that this uh, uh, dysfunction in lysosomes in, and autophagy extends uh, and impairs other uh, important cargo. In particular, um, damaged mitochondria are cleared almost exclusively by autophagy or mitophagy. <clears throat> and we can use sort of similar approaches. In this case, we're using a protein called Kima, which uh, changes its um, absorption in a pH dependent way. And so you can set up the imaging to then be able with ratio metric approaches to look selectively at chema that's either in a neutral environment or an acidic environment and uh, infer mitophagy rates. And what we see also is that the mitophagy rates in um, our FTD models are impaired. So this leads me to um, <clears throat> propose a mo working model of progranulin in health and disease. Um, you know, and I think this has uh, had been substantially validated uh, since uh, we originally uh, got these results and kind of came up with the model. Um, we think progranulin may be this really interesting uh, polypeptide that almost may be a, an extracellular sensor uh, of, uh, uh, of activity. And depending on the enzymes, and proteases that are present in that space uh, can lead to the production of pro-inflammatory granulins or anti-inflammatory uh, holo uh, pro progranulin. Um, and we think that this uh, progranulin protein gets taken up by a variety of cell surface receptors, including sortilin, traffic through endosomes to lysosomes, where it performs a really important lysosomal function that we still don't fully understand. What's interesting too, I think, is that um, the progranulin gene itself contains a response element for TFEB, and TFEB is a transcription factor that uh, is very closely associated with lysosomes and in a sense reads out uh, the sort of lysosomal function and is important for biogenesis of lysosomes. So somehow progranulin is part of the same uh, uh, transcriptional program that's involved in regulating lysosomal biogenesis and function of the autophagy pathway. And what I think is fascinating too about our results is that um, on the one hand, uh, they show progranulin uh, is clearly a substrate for the autophagy pathway, but at the same time, it also clearly seems to regulate uh, lysosomal function in the autophagy pathway, so quite complex. And then <clears throat> just to return to the point I made early on, why, uh, what can progranulin teach us? I think that what this suggests is that um, lysosomal function in the autophagy pathway may be particularly critical uh, for putting patients at risk for neurodegenerative disease. And it may actually also be a reason, uh, you know, connecting proteostasis to aging as well, um, to, because we can see this clear dose dependent effect of progranulin levels on lysosomal function, which also seems to correlate both with um, age-related neurodegenerative diseases. And so um, the, what, the way we've been thinking about it is that there may in fact be common threads that cut across multiple neurodegenerative disorders. We got into this because of the link between um, haploid sufficiency, progranulin, and a rare neurodegenerative disease called frontotemporal dementia. But now having studied it for a while and seeing these clear links to neuroinflammation and to autophagy, uh, which are both common features of other neurodegenerative diseases, we're starting to think that uh, maybe these different disorders may have quite distinct initiating factors. They're clearly different clinical syndromes, um, but they at some point may engage common pathways like neuroinflammation or protein dyshomeostasis. <clears throat> Those in turn may drive neurodegeneration, but I think it's also very important to keep in mind that many of these disorders don't show up until the fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life, uh, despite the fact that many of these are, are driven by uh, gene mutations that are present from birth. So what that suggests to us is that actually the nervous system is doing a pretty good job uh, keeping things at bay 
uh, until essentially the last coping mechanism fails. And that really, I think, uh, for us anyway, shifts some of our attention to what are some of these coping mechanisms and might those create new therapeutic options and targets? And I think what progranulin and FTD teach us is that the lysosome and the autophagy pathway probably is a really important pathway that's trying to stave off uh, some of these uh, issues with neurodegenerative disease and maybe part of a beneficial adaptive response that we might be able to in some way harness. Um, <clears throat> so, and I don't think, you know, we have to reach those conclusions solely from the work on FTD. Uh, this is a review that I written a couple of years ago where, you know, just a partial list of some of the genes that have been associated, particularly with neurodegenerative disease and connections that, that have been reported with the autophagy pathway. And to me, to me it's quite striking uh, how many uh, neurodegenerative disease genes uh, have at least some links to the autophagy pathway. It doesn't prove that uh, autophagy causes neurodegenerative disease, but it does suggest that impairments in this pathway may be really important for uh, putting patients at risk. And I think for a lot of those reasons, it's attracted our attention as a potential therapeutic target. Um, as many of you know, uh, uh, there are two major protein clearance pathways in cells, the ubiquitin proteasome pathway and the autophagy pathway. But there are reasons to uh, think the autophagy pathway in particular might be attractive. And one is that uh, one of the hallmark features of many neurodegenerative diseases is the propensity of proteins associated with those diseases to uh, form aggregates. And one of the issues with proteasome function is that proteins have to be unfolded to be able to thread, th thread through the sort of narrow pore of the proteasome and some aggregates really resist that. Whereas autophagy may be able to engulf uh, the formation of those aggregates. Um, structures called uh, autophagophores are these open sort of scoops uh, that form around aggregates before they get fused to lysosomes so the degradation can occur. The other thing that I just can't help mentioning is that uh, there is this clear link between autophagy and aging. Uh, and in particular, the general idea that caloric restriction, at least for short-lived species, uh, does seem to increase longevity. And one of the things that caloric restriction does is it stimulates <clears throat> this autophagy pathway, in part because autophagy uh, uh, recycles uh, in nutrients. And so it's a way for a cell to be able to degrade uh, proteins that it may have already in the cell to be able to produce nutrients to survive. So one of the things we did several years ago uh, was to try to find small molecules that can induce autophagy in primary neurons. Um, we had tried some of the uh, molecules that people had reported in literature that had worked in non neuronal cells, but to be honest, um, we found that in neurons, uh, many of those, especially ones that acted through the so-called mTOR-dependent pathway, weren't very effective. And so this led us to a broader search, still a candidate-based approach, um, but it did lead us to a number of small molecules that seemed to induce autophagy effectively in neurons um, using an mTOR-independent independ pathway. A number of these were already structures that uh, were FDA approved drugs orally administered across the blood brain barrier. So it gave us some encouragement that uh, there may be some path forward uh, ultimately to things like this uh, that could be, for example, brought to patients. We initially used some of that structure activity relationship data from that initial screen together with a computational chemist to be able to uh, create this three dimensional pharmacophore that was. Uh, an effort to try to understand what about the scaffolds were important for inducing autophagy. And we could in turn use this scaffold in silico to screen much larger compound libraries. Uh, and we did this for a million compound library to identify a number of additional uh, small molecules that we could actually purchase that were already uh, synthesized to be able to um, uh, continue to improve our chemistry hypothesis and the potency of our small molecules. Um, this uh, in turn uh, led us to launch a bona fide medicinal chemistry effort where we wanted to change the scaffold and remove a component that we knew was probably going to cause side effects in people and to further increase the potency and to get uh, molecules across the blood-brain barrier. And um, the progress has been encouraging. We now have compounds that can induce autophagy at low nanomolar concentrations. This is using our 
autophagy flux assay, where we're seeing a leftward shift in the turnover of our EOS3 dendro, or um, dendro2 LC3 2 construct, uh, and also have been able to demonstrate that the drugs get into um, the brain, they have drug like pro properties, and chronic dosing is safe. Um, and so these have been uh, now patented. And we've gone on to characterize those a little bit further uh, in some of our uh, disease models and have been able to demonstrate that these promote the clearance of TDP43 relevant to ALS and FTD, as well as uh, Huntington, Synuclein, and Tau, both relevant to FTD. Uh, they also fix some of the mislocalization that I mentioned earlier and improve the survival of our, both our rodent and human models. Uh, so again, providing some evidence that uh, this lysosomal dysfunction autophagy pathway may be a relevant uh, one for, and a common thread potentially for multiple neurodegenerative diseases. So our current model is that proteins prone to misfold may form these toxic conformers that may place stress on cells and that protein refolding and clearance pathways, particularly the autophagy lysosomal pathway, may be really helpful for mitigating some of those effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that context, uh, some of the structures, aggregates we see, inclusion bodies, as I mentioned earlier, may actually in some way be a short-term coping response for cells to reduce levels of toxic conformers. Mm -hmm. I think a really interesting open question for us is, uh, does this pathway, which we have mostly elucidated in neurons, is it the same in inflammatory cells? And I suspect it's different. Uh, neurons clearly, when they uh, get exposed to these toxic conformers, uh, succumb and eventually die and degenerate. But uh, microglia in particular and astrocytes seem instead to get activated or inflamed. And so uh, that is one area of active investigation that we're trying to look at further is really trying to um, begin to understand, do the cell autonomous effects of, uh, uh, of impairments that lead to neurodegeneration, do those have different manifestations in neurons and in glia that may explain what their, um, you know, the biology that they undergo and then ultimately um, how that all works together. And I think, yeah, I think that's it. Um, thought I had a... Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Finkbeiner, for a really beautiful presentation and, and really a whirlwind of study through through these models and, and the technology that you're using to do this. Um, I'm sure this is going to stimulate questions, and I, I'm hoping people will submit some questions through the Q&A function. I'll read them, and then you can sort of respond as, as we go here. That's um, great, Roger. I just wanted to throw up my, for some reason, I couldn't oh. advance my acknowledgement slide, so I, I, which is Please. the most important slide of a talk. <laughs> so it just pained me. Uh, so if I could just, uh, just add that, I mean, this obviously was a, a huge uh, joint effort from folks uh, in my lab. I want to give... Um, you know, many people credit uh, a lot of the uh, FTD work has been led by Lisa Leah and uh, and the uh, optical pulse labeling work was developed by Andre Svetkov. We've had tremendous contributions from a lot of folks who uh, with their automated microscopy. So I'll turn it back to you. Thanks for letting me do that. No, no, no problem. Thank, thank you. That's so important. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, I, I like the end of your talk in terms of thinking about obviously these pathways in, in other cell types and especially related to aging. But is there is there um, is there any progranulin story in in other cell types in in, in outside of the brain and, and sort of neurons and microglia that that you know might might be sort of interesting in terms of aging? Yeah, so uh, much has been written on this. I I focused mostly on the neuroscience part, but uh, people have seen. Um, especially the it's especially the connection to inflammation so when you look outside the nervous system what you see is um, a lot of evidence of abnormal inflammatory diseases bowel diseases bone diseases things like that so uh, there seems to clearly be a role even for granulin in the immune inflammatory system outside uh, uh, outside the cns for sure interesting and then then i was just wondering about you talked a lot about pro progranulin syndromes of progranulin de deficiency. Are the granulins in some sort of s similar ratio to progranulin? And, and is that, that sort of a kind of a constant or? 
Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, it's been frustratingly difficult to study because the tools to actually measure the individual granulins are really poor. So we have a couple that can measure a few, uh, but sadly, uh, that question remains largely unanswered. I would say, the, the one thing I would say is that um, although I tried to simplify the diagram to go from a holoprotein to just basically seven and a half bits of protein, there are intermediates that um, have some of the progranulins still connected that are thought to perform yet other independent functions too. So it's quite complex in terms of the relationship between the holoprotein and some of its proteolytic uh, products and sort of how that's uh, how the biology is affected, but we don't unfortunately really have a good understanding of how those how the stoichiometry is related and whether that's held constant. Thank you, thank you. And I, I don't know if it's a it's a it's a slow. Oh, here we go. One question coming in here: How does progranulin in lysosomes regulate Tfeb activity? Or does it regulate it? I guess too. Yeah, um, it's it's that's also a great question. Uh, I think I put that on the diagram because um, clearly a Tfeb binding site exists in the progranulin gene, and we know Tfeb is associated with lysosomes, and we know there is an abnormality of lysosome number and structure. Um, you know, in general, we don't know the answer to the specific question of how progranulin does it, um, but. There is um, a, a, a reasonably well investigated process uh, by which autophagy uh, can lead to Tfeb activity. Both uh, there's a whole complex that sits on the outside part of the lysosome involving mTOR and phosphorylation, uh, and it's an incredibly fascinating biology because. Basically, what it does is it sends nutrient status in cells and then uses that information to translate to, to basically release Tfeb so it can translocate to the nucleus where it can then activate lysosomes. So the way to think about it is uh, at least for uh, conditions of nutrient deprivation, which classically induce autophagy, um, the idea would be that uh, um, those biosensors uh, release Tfeb to stimulate uh, the production of lysosomes and basically other elements in the autophagy pathway with the goal, cellular goal of trying to uh, increase levels of autophagy uh, in a way that would release nutrients to be able to uh, mitigate the, the nutrient deprivation status and to enable the cell to survive that stress uh, to continue to live. Uh, exactly what progranulin does, I don't know yet. I think that's a really good question. <clears throat> and I it, can you detect with these elises? I, I don't know if you've done this or you, you're sort of working with colleagues. Can you detect progran progranulin with these elises in CSF or in, in in the circulation? Have there been initiatives to do that yet? Yeah, yeah. So um, we, you know, the, uh, people have used commercially available elises to do that. We. Uh, spent quite a bit of time optimizing the elysis in our hands to be able to do the work I showed you. Um, but for sure, um, commercially available ones are available and people can even reconstitute the ones we developed because we use commercially available antibodies. Um, uh, but what we found was the one we came up with was a little more sensitive and specific than the ones that we tested uh, that were commercially available. But for sure, those have been done. And um, and that's what led to the general observation that if you measure progranulin levels in, uh, for example, human sera, um, it's not exactly 50%. It tends to be, a, interestingly, a little bit higher than 50%, but that tends to be kind of the ballpark uh, uh, of what you can measure in patients with progranulin FTD. Interesting, interesting as a biomarker. So um, I, think, I think we don't have any other questions coming in, and I, it is just about two o'clock. So I really want to thank you, Steve, for a beautiful, beautiful seminar and presentation. The, the slides are absolutely beautiful and, and the, the work is so important. And I, and I think this, this um, overlay of these important clinical syndromes in neurology with this really fine molecular techniques is really a nice uh, translational approach to all of this. And, and it was really an elegant talk. So we really appreciate your time today and, and thank you for joining us for our seminar series. Thank, thanks so much and, and yeah, thanks thank everybody you. for attending.
I just Thank wanted you. to make one announcement. Um, I don't know if we can show the slide for our next seminar, which is on March 25th. Hope you can all join us. Uh, Tom Pearls uh, from Boston University School of Medicine will be speaking with us on the 25th on what is a trending exceptional longevity studies. And then we have uh, Dr. Vadim Gladyshev from Harvard, who's speaking on quantifying aging and rejuvenation, both really excellent speakers to continue the, the line of excellent presentations we've had in the series going forward. So again, thank you, Dr. Finkbeiner, and thank you all of all of the attendees today for participating in the seminar. And we look forward to having you join us again on March 25th. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much.